Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome again <coughs> for uh, another seminar here at the uh, Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And uh, today we will have the talk by uh, Dr. Iris Pereira, uh, Pereira Breda, and she will talk about the continuous rise of bulges out of galactic disks. Uh, <clears throat> about Iris, um, she initiated uh, her academic studies in environmental engineer. Uh, however, however, she do not feel she didn't feel uh, fulfilled. So um, she uh, decided to spend a couple of years outside the university, working to be able to financially support uh, the studies. Then she moved to Porto and enrolled in the master in astronomy. There, uh, her full dedication uh, culminated in being awarded a PhD fellowship in the same university, where she had been deeply exploring secular evolving galaxies. In the following uh, one and a half years, she was hired as a postdoc fellow there within the same institution. And finally, in the last year, she moved to Granada after ob obtaining a several Ochoa postdoctoral grant to explore extreme emission lines, uh, extreme emission line galaxies based on uh, JPAST uh, data. So thank you very much, Iris, for accepting this invitation, for giving us this seminar, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, so as you saw, my internet, for some reason, it's very unstable now. Let's hope everything will be good because I was already kicked out twice. Okay, so I'm here to talk uh, to you about uh, what I did in my master PhD in the following uh, small postdoc um, fellow that I got uh, in uh, Porto. And uh, basically we were exploring uh, secular evolution, as Rina said, um, <clears throat> uh, mostly giving mostly emphasis on bulges, but not only. So we studied, um, we, we, we studied deeply both the bulges and the disks and also the bars of a, a representative sample of uh, spiral galaxies. So basically what we know from what we know or what we know, what I knew before starting my master and my PhD, it's that basically there is two types of bulges, which basically means that there is two types of spiral galaxies. So. On the one hand, we have the spiral galaxies that host a classical bulge. And on the other hand, we have the ones that host a pseudo bulge. The differences are striking. Only by looking at the, the images, one can understand that indeed there is a big difference between these two. So uh, the classical bulges, basically, <laughs> they are very red and big. And uh, by looking at their spectra, we can understand that they are pressure supported systems. Um, and if we try to fit a, uh, the surface brightness profile uh, with the CERCIC law, we will find a high CERCIC index, higher than two. It's how uh, we define a, a classical bulge. Actually, Basically, most of the times, people, what they do, it's simply this. So they fit the CERCIC index, the uh, surface brightness profile of these bulges. If it's higher than two, it classified as classical bulges. And if it's lower than two, it classified as pseudo bulges. So yes, and on the other hand, the pseudo bulges, they are much faint. They are usually blue, have blue colors. Um, and if one goes and look at the, the stellar populations, we will see that they are rotationally supported. Um, we also see that usually pseudo bulges are mostly hosted by uh, low mass star, uh, low mass galaxies, whereas classical bulges, usually they are hosted by high mass galaxies. So uh, <laughs> when they discover the second type of uh, bulges, this pseudo bulges, that is uh, recent, uh, let's say, has uh, some decades only, uh, astronomers like myself, <clears throat> they, um, they un understood that uh, 
they come from very different, because they are so different, so they must come from very different assembly routes. So basically how it's defined nowadays is that the, a, a galaxy hosts a classical bulge, formed first its bulge <clears throat> through violent quasi-monolithic collapse, for instance, or mergers, <clears throat> and then it gathered it, its disk around it gradually. Whereas the pseudo bulges, they are thought to be formed gradually out of the disk. So in one hand, we have the disk forming first for the pseudo bulges that uh, gradually gives rise of a, a central excess, which we call a pseudo bulge. And on the other hand, we have the other spirals that are formed in a completely different way through first the bulge is formed and then the disk is accreted around it. Uh, so this means that we would expect a bimodal age distribution and not only age, but in color and everything, because I mean, if, if these uh, two um, galactic structures, they come from two so different assembly roots, then we should be able to see it when we study them. So, <clears throat> but what happens is that the observational data that is available at most show high, sp uh, high spread uh, transition, never a bimodality as we expect from the theory. So the goal of this uh, project was to clarify whether indeed the CBs and PBs, classical pseudobulges, are really evolutionary distinct or they are the opposite ends of a continuous evolutionary sequence. So let's start by thinking about what will be the limitations in previous studies. So I am lucky because when I entered in astronomy um, some years ago, maybe seven, seven to six years ago, IFU, uh, integral field spectroscopy, was uh, appearing. But before that, all the studies are based basically on single fiber spectroscopy or long slit spectroscopy. So we didn't have the power to spatially resolve the galaxy as we wished, like now we have. So this will introduce aperture biases, obviously, because for instance, all the studies that are based on the single fiber spectroscopy, uh, so the, <clears throat> the fiber has a um, um, the, the size of the fiber, it's always the same, right? But so it depends if the galaxy is bigger or smaller, if it's further or closer, we will uh, get different uh, parts of the galaxy according uh, to these things. So for instance, in one case, the fiber will collect uh, uh, light only from one specific part of the bulge, a more central part, whereas for other galaxy, it can collect uh, light from both bulge and disk, for instance. So of course, this will um, introduce biases. Then we have obviously the spectral modeling biases because, uh, well, spectral modeling is not uh, an easy task. It has uh, many degeneracies. So we have to count on these two. And then uh, regarding our, uh, the structural analysis, so the photometric analysis, <coughs> well, I told you before that uh, basically we rely on the CERCIC index to define whether a spiral galaxy is uh, formed in one way or in another way, if it's classified as classical or pseudo. Uh, but actually the CERCIC index, it's also subjected to many uh, to many, to one, the gener there is a, a big degeneracy that is very difficult to solve between the effective radius and the Cersei eta. And obviously, the adopted methodology that we use to model the bulge um, will also impact our results. So for this uh, work, we try to overcome these limitations. So for the aperture biases, we use IFU spectroscopy. Uh, for the modeling, spectral modeling biases, we repeat the analysis using two different stellar libraries <clears throat> and different stellar population synthesis codes. For the structural analysis regarding this degeneracy I told you about between the CERCIC index and effective radius, <clears throat> I've developed a tool that is called iFit that uh, <clears throat> fits the surface brightness profile of the bulge uh, by fitting a CERCIC index in a way that in theory, it uh, should be free from this degeneracy, at least in theory. Um, 
And uh, regarding the methodology to model the bulge, we try to be consistent and to minimize the use of methods that rely on strong prior assumptions that we might not be certain of. So uh, we pass for the sample selection. So from all the Khalifa, we use the Khalifa survey in the study. So from all the Khalifa galaxies that we had, we took all the late type galaxies that are face on or nearly face on that we clearly see the bulge and uh, we are sure that by, by taking uh, pixels of the bulge, we are not taking also disk. Uh, and non-interacting galaxies. We want pure secular evolving galaxies. So we end up with, with 135 galaxies covering all uh, morphological types. Uh, I mean, late type, obviously, morphological types. And we end up with a very representative sample of the local population spiral galaxies that covers approximately three decks in total stellar mass. So uh, then we go to, the first step was to go to the surface photometry because we, what we really wanted was to be able to isolate the bulge. So to know precisely what are the spaxels that belong to the bulge. So for this, we use um, the STSS data uh, and uh, by using uh, iFit that I told you about, um, we decompose the, the galaxy into disk, bar and bulge as it's uh, shown here, for instance, with the exponential disk in blue, and then the bar is in purple, and the bulge after subtraction in red. We fit it, we get a CERSIC index. However, we are not so interested in the CERSIC index uh, in this work. We are mostly interested, as I said, in the radial extent of the bulge, because this will determine uh, the spaxels that belong to the bulge and the ones that belong to the disk and bar. Uh, and we also did something else, which is we decided not to subtract the disk and simply fit a, a CERSIC uh, profile to the, uh, to the excess luminosity in the center. And this is given by the, um, by the orange line, so the bulge without subtraction. And this is what we took, this RB from the bulge um, without, being, uh, sub without subtracting a disk. And for instance, in the image, we, <clears throat> we show you this um, uh, the circle that corresponds to precisely to this RB. Uh, so then we went to computation uh, to the computation of color maps and profiles with the SDSS data. And from this, we obtained uh, all the, um, the color maps and uh, color gradients also. Uh, and then uh, from the images, in order to obtain radial profiles, we use a technique that is called ISAN, uh, isophoto annually technique, which is supposed to be um, more um, reliable um, than the typical uh, fitting ellipses because it traces the morphology of the galaxy. So ISAN, what it does is basically to understand the isophotes um, of the, the galaxy. And then it takes uh, basically uh, it uh, computes what is the area within this isophot and uh, to pass it through uh, to, to a radio profile, basically it assumes a circle with the same area as it is inside this, uh, I, this isophot. So like this, we are able to trace much better the morphologies compared to any other um, circular or elliptic uh, tool that doesn't, re doesn't care about the morphology of the galaxy at all. So uh, yeah, after having the, 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 the radial profiles, as I showed here, for instance, we also computed um, color gradients. So by fitting linear regressions to understand uh, how the color is changing within the bulge and within the disk also. And uh, then we went to the modeling of the IFS data. And um, by this time, father was not uh, yet done. So Starlight, I, I suppose you, you are more familiarized with Starlight. It's a code uh, developed to, uh, it's 100% it's, uh, stellar. So just uh, takes into consideration the theoretical spectra of stellar populations. And with a combination of these uh, um, SSPs, simple stellar populations, it tries to fit the observed spectra. 
Uh, Fado, it's another of these codes, but that takes the nebular continuum into consideration, the, the nebular contribution into consideration. But by this time, we didn't have it yet. So this study is basically uh, based on starlight. Uh, so we take the Khalifa V500 data and we put it on Porto 3D, which is, in, uh, which is our um, pipeline in Porto uh, to, to do spectral modeling in a spatial resolved manner. And it's based on starlight, as I said before. So for this, we use two different libraries, um, spectral libraries. Uh, one, the first one, um, it goes up to only the solar metallicity. So it has four different solar metallicities with the maximum being one. Uh, sorry, so four metallicities with the maximum being one solar. And then Z5 that includes all the, the Z4 uh, SSPs plus uh, 1.5 uh, solar metallicity. So in the end, it comprises approx uh, 38 ages between 1 million year and 13 giga years. And uh, we put it to run for several months, all these 135 galaxies, Paxel by Paxel, uh, with these two things, with these two spectral libraries. After some months, we have the, then the, the results, and we, we start comp to compute the maps of all the quantities of interest that we want. For instance, the stellar mass, uh, present and the one that was ever formed through the life of the galaxy, uh, mass and lightweight of stellar age and metallicity, stellar surface density, several emission lines that we wanted to study, etc. And uh, as we did with the, with, the, um, uh, with the colors that I was saying before in the maps of the colors, we also applied the ISAM technique in all these maps in order to obtain radial profiles of all these quantities that we are interested at. Uh, we also uh, classify the, the bulges according to, um, to their activity, let's say, by, by BPT diagnostics using three different methods. Uh, but in the end, they were consistent between each other. So, okay. And after that, we post process um, the, the, the results from Starlight with Remove Young. So, Remove Young is another. Uh, it's a tool from uh, Porto that was developed in Porto that allows to spectroscopically subtract the contribution of stellar populations that are older than whatever we want. So we define an age. So basically, it analyzes the best fitting stellar population vector. So the output from starlight in this case, but can be FAD or PPXF or any other of these tools. And it computes the synthetic spectrum images and magnitudes in different filters by convolving with the filter transmission curve and stellar mass maps of the stellar old component. We adopted eight uh, different TCATs, we call it TCATs. So the, um, the ages that we will um, remove all the, the younger part of the, of the contribution. So, we, we used 30, 100, 300 million, and one, three, five, seven, and nine giga years. So basically, uh, for instance, if we, um, if we are talking about the TCAT uh, for nine giga years, basically what we will observe will be um, the, the, the light that comes from the galaxy after being stripped of all the stellar populations that are younger than nine giga years. And then we did the same for the seven, for the five, and so on, so that we can see uh, basically how the, the, assuming that there's no radial migration, obviously, we can see how the, the, the stellar mass uh, builds up in the galaxy. For instance, this is a GIF I did with the Muse, it's not the Khalifa, much better resolution. Uh, and remove young. So you see basically the galaxy is being stripped by, by its uh, younger solar populations. So that, uh, for instance, the last image you see, the most faint image, is the one that has only the light contribution of nine giga year uh, stellar populations. Uh, so this gave us, uh, after again taking these images, processing it with design, we obtain radial profiles. And here we have an, uh, three exemplary cases for, um, for our sample. 
uh, of, of the Khalifa galaxies, as I was, as I was saying. Uh, so if one looks at the radial profiles, it's very interesting to see uh, that uh, there, are, there are striking differences between these galaxies. For instance, if we look at what we call the interval A galaxies, so the, the first one, we see that there is a nearly homologous stellar mass growth through all the galaxy because independently if it's in the center or in the disk, we see that more or less this, um, uh, so this, that the different radial profiles that you see in different colors correspond to these different um, stellar populations that with different ages. So for instance, the red, will be the corresponding for the, the stars that are only uh, older than nine giga years. And so one, for instance, um, so it's a nine, seven, as I said, uh, five, three, for instance, the green corresponds to all the star populations that are older than one giga year uh, and so on. So uh, indeed what we see is that basically the, the disk, shows always a quasi homologous growth in every galaxy, but not the bulge. The bulge tells us a very different story depending on, on the galaxy. So for the IA galaxies, the first ones, the top ones, we see that indeed their bulge and the disk, they are more or less the same. They grow more or less the same pace. But if we look at the IC galaxies, the bulge has no star formation since like nine giga years because all of the light that is coming from there, it's uh, from it's equivalent basically to the contribution of nine uh, giga years light. And then we have the intermediate kind of galaxies um, that are, let's say, between these two. It's not that their, their bulge was formed nine giga years ago, but it's not like it's forming at the same pace of the disk like IA galaxies. So by this, we devised um, a parameter, let's say, which we called delta mu 9 giga. I will call it only delta mu, which is basically the difference between the total light and the light contribution of stellar populations older than 9 giga years, this only within the bulge radius. Uh, so basically, for instance, for the interval A, we can see from the plot that it can be about 2 mag, 1.5 to 2 mag, Whereas for the interval C galaxies is nearly zero, this delta mu value. Uh, so this is an extinction and distant independent indicator of the bulge evolutionary status. And we use this to classify our sample into these different intervals, A, B, or C. And uh, this is the result. So, or one of the results, the most um, important results, let's say, from this work. So uh, the first panel, panel A, serves only for us, for, for you to understand how I devised our galaxies into class A, B, and C. So it's, it shows the mass stellar age uh, versus delta mu. And well, you can see the ones that I, that I classified as blue are the, the, that I painted blue, sorry, that's, are classified as IA, then the, the green, and then the red. So this is a bit arbitrary, but it's only to be able for us to, to follow if uh, in the other, um, the, the subsequent uh, correlations that we might find, if this still holds, and indeed it does. You can see that there's all uh, the, this class C, for instance, they're always in the right side, most of the, of the plots. The B are in between and the IA are, um, down. So uh, then the, the panel B shows the mass of the bulge versus the mass weighted stellar age. And as we can see, there is a clear uh, continuity and um, a correlation between these two parameters. Uh, then I show you the total galaxy mass versus the mass of the bulge. Again, a very clear correlation. Uh, then the, the mass of the bulge versus the mass weighted stellar age, the mass of the bulge versus the bulge stellar surface density, and the BPT diagrams. So what do we see? We see that uh, basically there is a continuity, point number one, this is striking. There's no bimodality as we would be expecting if this, these two would come from two different, completely different assembly routes as, uh, as we learned from the state of the art. 
besides that, we see that uh, our class A bulges, they are uh, always low mass. They are hosted by low mass galaxies. Uh, they, they are younger. They have lower, um, lower metallicities in their stellar uh, populations. Uh, and they are uh, less dense. They, they have lower uh, stellar surface density. And also, if we look at the BPT, we will see that they are star formed. They are classified as star forming. Uh, and if we go to the other side of the spectrum, let's say to the IC galaxies, these are the more massive bulges, older, uh, hosted by more massive galaxies. They are more metal enriched and they are much more um, dense. And uh, if, by looking at the PPT, usually they are classified as liner or cipher or composite. Uh, and then we have the IB right in between. Another interesting thing I would like to, to tell you is if you notice there is um, a gray uh, star that represents the values that we know for the Milky Way. And when I put the values that, that we know, it follows beautifully all of these trends, which is very interesting. Uh, so we continue our analysis to compare bulge and disk. And it's very interesting to see that these two are correlated. They are even even for the IC, the that supposedly they come they they are formed independently. They are quite uh, co uh, quite well correlated between each other, independently of the um, the the. The SSP library that we use. So on uh, on the top, it's for the for the Z4, the ones that. Uh, the library that goes only until one solar metallicity and the down one, it's for the 1.5. It goes up to 1.5 solar metallicity. The results are consistent. And as I said, there is a clear correlation between these two stellar components. Uh, however, it's interesting to see that in the low mass uh, part, so our class A galaxies basically, their bulge and disk is indistinguishable, basically. We see that there is no big differences between the... I'm, I'm sorry, I was saying uh, it was different uh, spectral libraries, but no, it's for the stellar age and the stellar metallicity, sorry. Um, so both the stellar age and metallicity, they are basically the same for the IA galaxies, and they diverge more and more and more, uh, but still they are correlated even for the high mass galaxies, the IC. Uh, then we go for the stellar age gradients. <clears throat> uh, so we computed what would be the difference between the age in the center and in the periphery of the bulge. For both uh, mass-weighted stellar age and luminosity-weighted uh, stellar age. So, uh, and here uh, I show for, for uh, the two libraries, so starlight. Z4 in the left-hand side and the Z5 in the right-hand side. So the Z5, just to remember, it's the 1.5, it goes to 1.5 solar metallicity. And again, the results are consistent. There is again a continuity, not a bimodality. And uh, what we see is that uh, basically the class A galaxies, they, are, they have positive gradients, which means that they have, uh, they are forming stars now mostly in the center. So the, 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 the center is younger than the periphery of the bulge. Whereas for the IC galaxies, it's the opposite. So we see that the periphery is older than the center. Uh, sorry, it's younger than the center. So basically we interpret these results uh, in a way that, um, Basically, because the, the potential, well, it's right in the center of the galaxy, the gas will condensate faster there. So now that we are uh, in icy galaxies, that now in the present day, they have so much available gas, uh, which is not the case for IC, um, uh, the gas condensates in the center. So this is where there is more star formation as compared to the periphery. However, there is also in the periphery. But that's why then in the center, we have younger stellar uh, populations as compared to the periphery of the bulge. But then if we imagine that this bulge grows, right? It's forming stars, so it's growing, growing, growing until a certain point where something happens. 
For instance, AGN feedback happens. So that there will be a, a quenching, um, inside out quenching uh, um, uh, episode. Uh, so if one thinks that the quenching will start from the center, it will travel, let's say, to the periphery, and this will take some time. Uh, so basically, the, the center will be quenched first. Whereas in the periphery, the, the star formation will still continue. And that is why we see the opposite effect. So negative uh, um, uh, gradients, age gradients for these icy bulges that are already quenched. Are quenched, we saw since 90 years at least. And recently, I'm, I'm back to this project. Uh, I decided to explore better. Uh, so because these are all average quantities. It's the mean age, the mean metallicity, and so on. So now I, we've decided to, to go again to be sure that, because what happens with mean, uh, mean um, quantities is that they might not represent the, a, a continuity, let's say, because imagine if, we, if one has two star forming episodes, uh, of equivalent intensity, one now and another 10 giga years ago, we will have a mean age of five giga years. So this is not representative of what's really happening in the galaxy. So now I'm uh, exploring the, the individual star formation histories of these bulges, just to be sure that our um, mean quantities that we derived are representative of what is really happening. Um, and uh, yes, indeed we see, so for instance, uh, in the left-hand side where I show the star formation histories, the right-hand side is the star formation rates for the different uh, galaxies uh, on top from the top is IA and IB then, and then IC. And basically this is all the galaxies uh, overplotted, let's say, for, for, the diff for these three different classes. And we see indeed that the, the star formation histories of IA galaxies are much more slow as compared to the IC. The IC was uh, faster and earlier, whereas uh, the I, IA, it's going much more slowly in a more continuous way. And the star formation rates show uh, more or less the same, the same, the same phenomenon, the same thing. Um, so with these plots, we derived uh, um, these two things. So in the left-hand side, I show you the T80. T80 is the time necessary for these bulges to acquire 80% of its mass. And again, uh, um, here I show you also the disk. So the disk is with the small circles and the bulge, the, the big circles. So indeed we see that uh, for these uh, low mass galaxies, they took much, much longer time to acquire 80%, uh, to assemble 80% of their mass uh, as compared to icy bulges that they were very, they did this very fast and very early in time. Um, and in the right hand side, I show you the e folding time. So by fitting a um, uh, uh, declining uh, expon uh, exponential uh, star formation history, let's say, we obtain the folding time. And again, this is what we, we see. It's recurrent, uh, this shape, this continuity, and uh, this shape where IB, uh, IA galaxies, they, their bulges and disks are basically the same. And uh, the more, uh, uh, the higher the mass, the higher it's the difference between bulge and disk, but still they are still uh, very much correlated between each other. So let's go back to the question, is there an evolutionary sequence in late type galaxies? So as I showed you, and as I said over and over again, <laughs> our results are indeed incompatible with the bimodal age distribution in the bulges of spiral galaxies, which is implied by, by these two distinct assembly routes I explained you, one directing to old monolithically formed CBs uh, that form independently of their disks, and other that emerge through quasi-continuous star formation in the center of secularly evolving disks. Instead, our analysis suggests that bodies in disk evolve alongside, which leads to a continuum of physical and evolutionary properties, as is exemplified by our intervals, by our delta mu intervals. 
uh, additionally, according to our results, we see that uh, all late type galaxies independently, they appear to follow the same evolutionary path. However, having different evolutionary paces or metabolisms, as I like to call, which is dictated by the total galaxy mass. So we are already familiar with this by uh, the downsizing scenario, when we talk about galaxies on their whole, uh, so that more massive galaxies, they evolve faster as compared to less massive. And here what we see, it's a kind of a subgalactic downsizing scenario for the pulse. So basically, uh, they they follow the same um, the same uh, uh, evolutionary route, let's say, but uh, the ones that are more massive they evolve faster. Uh, and here it's a scheme that we present on the on the first paper regarding this analysis, uh, where we try to explain this. So we don't know if IA galaxies form a bit later or at the same time. Um, of IC, we leave uh, at this space. There is no way to know for sure. But what we propose is that if you look, uh, so basically that rotating disks will be the first structures to be formed. So if you have a, a, a huge mass of gas that is rotating because everything in the universe dances for some reason, uh, so it will. Um, get um, like a pancake, right? And uh, it will form a disk, basically. And then what we suggest is that the gravitational potential well, uh, which is much higher in an icy galaxy, so in a cloud that starts uh, as being uh, very massive, um, will promote inside um, the, so the gas will travel very fast inside for icy galaxies, which have a very deep potential well. So it's very easily, very easy. And since also the gas is dissipative, dissipative it's very easy for the gas to travel uh, to the center. So this means that for these massive galaxies with uh, deep potential wells, very early in time and very fast, the bulge will form because a, a huge amounts of gas will travel to the center where they will collapse to form the bulge. But for IA galaxies, this will happen the same, but in a pace that it's much, much, much slower. That's why even today, and maybe probably not even 30 giga years, IA will be IC, because the pace is much, much slower. But OK, we propose that the, it's exactly the same uh, assembly route, let's say. And then at some point, what you see is that in IC galaxies and also some in, in some IB. Uh, at some point, the AGN uh, will turn on, that will quench the, the bulge and it will stop its formation. Uh, and then, okay, uh, we continued um, because another question I had was regarding the, the disk of um, the disk inside the bulge, because what is assumed when one goes to do surface photometry, the first thing we do is to model the disk outside the bulge in the bar. Uh, we model it with an exponential. We assume that it goes exponentially uh, growing until the center. We subtract it, and then we fit to the remaining uh, light. We fit a bulge in a bar if, if um, that is the case. But for me, it was always, um, I always had a question if indeed, there is a, a, an exponential uh, disk inside the bulge. First, because by considering class A, class C, for instance, the more massive galaxies. So we, what we learn from the state of the art is that the bulge will be formed first and then the disk will be accreted around it. So it's strange that by having already a very kinematically hot um, stellar component such as the bulge, it's strange to me how the disk will be formed later on and will still be able to, to, to be formed with an expo exponentially uh, so that its maximum it's inside the bulge um, after we already have the bulge uh, formed. And also, even if they form at the same time, 
uh, I was always wondering that because these bulges, for instance, they are extremely, they are very hot kinematically. So I was always thinking that the interaction between bulge and disc should somehow uh, hit, um, uh, hit the, the cold orbits of the disc. And this with time might uh, mean that uh, the, the disc won't be disc anymore, it will be transformed, let's say, in a bulge. So we uh, thought about an experiment on how to, um, to test this. And what we did was, so we went to, this, to the photometry and we fitted a disc with three different uh, configurations, as it's shown here in this image. The pure exponential in the blue, uh, a flat disc that after the, uh, the radius of the bulge inside the radius starts flattening, uh, and a decreasing. So after the RB, when it enters RB, it goes uh, until zero, basically. Uh, and this is the photometry. And then we went to the spectroscopy. Uh, and so this is a kind of a hybrid approach. So we computed the integrated observed spectrum of the bulge. So we summed all the spaxels that belong to the bulge. And we went to the disk and we took, uh, we, we computed an average representative spectra of the disk. We modeled these two spectra uh, with starlight and father. And we de uh, determined the, the best fitting uh, stellar uh, spectra. Then we compute the scaling factors for the observed disk by integrating the observed SPP. So basically, we, with, by assuming these three disk configurations, as I told you, we ask the question, what would be the fraction of light that corresponds or inside the, inside the bulge area, inside RB, what would be the fraction of light that corresponds to the disk if we assume it to be exponential, flattening, or centrally depressed? And with this information, we went back to the, to the, um, to the spectroscopy and basically we scaled the, the spectra of the disk in a way to be compatible with what we were seeing uh, or what we were measuring in the uh, photometry. So we scaled it accordingly. For a pure exponential, this will be the, what we have to scale for the inwardly flattening for the centrally depressed. And then we subtract and we look on our residuals um, by refitting them, <clears throat> by refitting them again with starlight and father. So basically what we saw is that by doing this exercise, independently of the total mass of the galaxy, approximately one third of our sets <clears throat> obtained after subtracting an exponential or inwardly flattening model yield negative flux. In the mostly in the blue spectral range. So basically, after uh, scaling our typical um, spectra of the disk and subtracting to our total, assuming uh, an exponential um, um, exponential law, we obtain negative flux. So something we are doing wrong, right? Uh, apart from that. Approximately one third, again, of the disubtracted bulges reach the maximum age or metallicity of the library. This is also an indication that something is wrong. And um, approximately one third of the stellar mass after subtraction is higher than the one that we originally had. Again, something is wrong here. So <laughs> this study suggests that a significant fraction of late type galaxies, the disk cannot uh, show at least with our assumptions, it cannot show a, a, um, a, an ex neither exponential or inwardly flattening. It must be, it must have a, a central depress depression inside the pulse radius. <clears throat> so I will go now for the conclusions. <laughs> uh, our comp combined analysis of uh, very representative sample of the local uh, g spiral galaxy population by using surface photometry, specialties of spectral modeling, and remove young, remove, uh, revealed that our bulges span a continuous sequence of increasing delta mu with increasing mass, stellar surface density, age, and metallicity. There is clearly a lack of an uh, age by modality, which argues against the two distinct bulge assembly routes 
and suggests instead a unified scenario for the formation of late type galaxies. We also see that the to total stellar mass of the spirals, it's what regulates basically the assembly time scale of the bulge and also of the disk, but of the bulge in a more um, intense, let's say. Uh, so we call it like the galactic metabolism, so that in low mass galaxies, this metabolism is very slow, but for high mass galaxies, it has a higher metabolism. We can also see that bulges <laughs> undergo an interwoven evolution with their parent disks. They do not appear to evolve separately, to the contrary. And finally, we see that for a substantial fraction of local spiral galaxies, the parent disks cannot preserve its exponential intensity slope inside the bulge radius. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Iris, for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, now the, the talk is open for questions. Please uh, raise your hand and then you're allowed to make the question. <clears throat> okay, we have a question by Rosa. Go on, Rosa, please. Hello, Iris. Thanks for, for the talk. Um, I have a, um, a comment and a question relating with the methodology that you have followed to subtract the bulge component. What I understand is that you take the, the images, uh, HST images, and you there uh, fit the profile. And with this, uh, the solution of this profile, you retrieve from the um, uh, data queue from Khalifa the, the, the bulge and the, this component of the galaxy. So, I wonder how they must be affected by the chain of the, of the um, uh, observing condition to make this extrapolation. Also, because um, there is, a, well, I don't know if you have the, the possibility to compare this result with the result that uh, Jairo made a, a view obtaining um, doing a similar analysis, but uh, using only the Khalifa data. So they use a, a code that uh, um, he did, where they, in a, a very consistent way, they use the, all the data queue at all the wavelength to retrieve the bulge and the, this component. So do you like to comment this? Uh... I'm not uh, familiar with this um, work, so I, uh, on this I cannot comment. But uh, just to say we didn't use HST imaging data; we used SDSS data. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's it's just a detail. It's uh, independent of the of the Khalifa data. Okay. Yes, independently of the Khalifa data. Yes, I mean it should be. It should be consistent, right? Uh, we we expect it to be the same, whether if it's observed in SDSS or it's just because the with the the Khalifa usually it goes uh, it observes it doesn't observe uh, the whole radial extent of the galaxy. So if one wants to to fit uh, properly a disk, it's not that maybe with the Khalifa one can also do that, but because the SDSS uh, it goes further away because it has higher sensitivity. So we can we see more of the disk that we can, um, in theory, maybe uh, model it better. But uh, it but, should uh, be the same. But uh, something that uh, I don't have clear, you have to take into account is that the modeling the the of the radial profile must depend on the of the wavelength. So that's why it is good to, to do this analysis for using the data queue instead of um, uh, external images. Because oh, uh, sure, sure. the of the wavelength and how do, how do you translate this uh, uh, wavelength dependence to, um, to extract the, the, the spectra from, 
from we corrected the, we corrected from this so we took in consideration the the transmission curve of the filter and we corrected for for this uh, for this effect so we saw that okay uh, within let's say the r filter um the disk uh, if we assume a pure exponential should be uh I don't know, 30% um, of the total that we see in the bulge. And then in the in the in order to, S to scale the, the the observed spectrum as extracted from the Khalifa, we took this uh, into consideration, we corrected for, from this effect so that we are sure that we are consistent. Mm. Okay. I see but uh, this is complicated. I Sorry? think it is more complicated than this, but anyway. Uh, this is all nice published. To... You can, if yeah, you want, I can send you several paper in this line related mm -hmm. with the with the code and also the resolving. General resolving was not only for the um, for a sample of later galaxies, it is for different type of galaxies. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other, and the other question is related with the. Did you take into account um, if the galaxy has a bar or not for the uh, modeling or internal no. bar? Uh, for this, for this particular project, no. We we did it independently of uh, if it's barred or not barred. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rosa. Another question for Iris? Okay, seeing none, uh, let's thanks again, Iris, for this talk. And uh, great talk, say Pepe Vilches in the chat. And thank you again for, for your talk and uh, see you all participants in the next uh, seminar. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you, bye bye.